Good afternoon, everyone. Hey, my name's. Uh, do I have the <clears throat> do I have the permission to start, Manit? Okay. Hello, everyone. Namaste, and welcome to today's session. My name is Ravi Santlani, and I'm the founder of School News, India's largest media platform for the education sector. We have over 1982 attendees registered for this webinar today, and are live with us both on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you all for your interest. A uh, little backstory uh, of why we are doing this webinar today. It was sometime late last year when I was in New Delhi for Piggy Arai's conference, where uh, I and Manit were chatting about some random things. And I told Manit that uh, my visit to his school is long due. And he instantly asked me to pay a visit to his school the very next day. He mentioned that he was hosting a delegation of a few educators from Hyderabad and had allocated a couple of hours to take them through the experiential model that they are known for. I made some minor changes in my travel schedule and visited Heritage Experiential Learning School in Gurgaon. And trust me, ladies and gentlemen, those two hours were one of the most well-spent hours in, long, in a long time. Ever since I'd been trying to uh, find an opportunity to get Manit and his team to share the same with more educators from India, and here we are today. As a matter of fact, when we were planning an Indian premiere of Professor Sohata Mitra's documentary at Manit's school, which unfortunately uh, was canceled due to the COVID situation, there were uh, many educators who registered for the same and later shared that it was because they wanted to also get a chance to have a look at heritage experiential learning approach. You see, everyone wants to enter the school. And uh, I, I also uh, uh, do remember reaching out to Bhavin Shah, the CEO of Education World magazine, while attending the Round Square International Conference 2019, which was so beautifully hosted by Siddharth Singh at his school, Emerald Heights International School in Indore. And I congratulated Bhavin for picking a heritage experiential learning school as the number one school of India in their annual ranking. These guys really deserve it. And I'm sure, I mean, you're going to experience this in the next 45 minutes or one hour uh, when they take you through the recipe of uh, how to make India's number one school. Thank you, Manit, for taking the time out from your busy schedule. Today's topic uh, is the experiential education recipe of a top rated and successful school. And to take you all through the journey of making of India's number one school, as I mentioned, we have with us Manit Jain, co-founder of the Heritage Schools, who will be also chairing the session. Vishnu Karthik, director of the Heritage Schools. Nina Kaul, director and principal Heritage Experiential Learning School. Uh, Ariana Abedia and Hefetz, who takes care of social emotional learning. Uh, Ezit Groff, uh, who's head teaching and learning at the same school. And uh, Noura Epnoshad, who's the head of design and technology of course, Heritage Experiential Learning School. A very warm welcome to you all. For those of you just joining us, welcome and enjoy the webinar. Over to you, Manet. Thank you so much, uh, Ravi. That's a lot of pressure on me. And uh, thank you for showing up in such large numbers, uh, all of you. A very good afternoon to you. Uh, I'm uh, going to start from the year 2003, when the school was set up. You know, within the first two weeks, uh, I decided I was going to spend some time inside the classroom, spent half a day. And uh, it was funny, uh, the experience brought back horrid memories of my own schooling. Uh, it was a very visceral feeling. I felt the same fear, anxiety, boredom, purposelessness as I experienced as a child. The experience left me very restless. I didn't sleep for a few days. And uh, I realized that after I'd left school, I'd never really thought about uh, what impact my education had on me. So I went into a conscious meditation into my schooling and got two powerful insights uh, that sparked this entire journey. One insight is what I called trained purposelessness or the hard duty factor. So my most vivid memory of it was in my mitosis class in grade eight. I went through this and many more lessons questioning why I was learning what I was learning. Unfortunately, never got anything beyond you got to do well in exams. And if you don't, you'll fail in life. Over a period of time, I stopped questioning. I got comfortable with the idea of not knowing why. I got conditioned to conform, conditioned to not inquire. Einstein said education should be perceived as a valuable gift and not as a hard duty. So what happens when you perform a hard duty for 14 years? That hard duty becomes a way of life. It doesn't leave you easily. So you don't get out of school all excited about what you do in college. 
or you don't get into the workplace looking for any deep passion or purpose. I've worked with large groups of parents. Uh, in a hall full of 500 parents, I definitely ask a question. Every time I get in, I ask, I ask the big question, how many of you have found your calling? How many of you have found your purpose? And typically not more than 10 or 15 hands go up. All of this is a result of not having meaning inside the classrooms. All of this is a result of lack of relevance in classrooms. So I believe my education robbed me of my sense of purpose of my swadhan. And the second insight was that I lost the ability to be myself. The fierce judgment, fear, humiliation, rankings, comparison, all of it battered my self-esteem. And I became too self-conscious, always too worried about what others were thinking and never really getting comfortable in my own sabha. And I believed if you were robbed of your ability to be yourself, and if you were robbed of your sense of purpose, then how could you experience true joy and happiness? So with a very strong conviction to change things, I started talking to educators around the country. Every principal that I spoke to would tell me the same thing. Hey, uh, what is wrong with you? Why do you want change? The system is like this only. Parents want good results. That all, that's all they care about. This is what teachers know how to do, the entire books, the entire system is di designed around this. What is wrong with it? Our, our people seem to be doing so well everywhere. And then I would stop arguing with them about it. And with a huge sense of what I did not want to do, but a very little sense of what else to do, I started on this journey to go look at some of the alternate schools around the country. So I was did the Krishnamurti schools, the Aurobindo schools, Center for Learning, and some schools across the world uh, with our whole team of teachers, uh, not all of them. But uh, I was looking for what else to do. And uh, while I got a lot of inspiration in some of these schools, one of the problems was that they also discouraged me in some ways. They said that a lot of the work that you're talking about, while your vision may be good, happens in elite parent communities where their definition of success is different, where they don't care about board examination the results. So anyhow, uh, when I realized this and when I looked at all of the principles uh, who didn't seem to have any kind of a model of change, I thought I found the purpose of my life. I decided that a model had to be created, a model for real, for meaningful, for experiential education that is relevant for the child and relevant for the times. So we got into preparations on a war footing and launched our new session in 2005, perhaps the largest experiment in mainstream schools in the country at that time. No uniforms, no textbooks, no subjects, no tests, no exams, a fully multidisciplinary project-based curriculum prepared by our own teachers from scratch, implemented within a year's time. For the initial years, we were accused of treating kids like guinea pigs. A third of our parents left. A lot of teachers resisted the movement. A lot of teachers burnt out, but those who hung on often tell me that this was the most gratifying journey of their lives, whether as parents or as teachers. As we kept refining the curriculum by 2013, as our classes came to grade 12 and all, we also started appearing amongst the list of top performing CBSE schools in the country and gaining recognition as one of the top schools. There is one thing I would say much more important than the results of the pedagogy was what we had achieved in terms of the core DNA of the organization, which was being a true learning community. So we never repeated lesson plans or unit plans. We kept reinventing constantly. And 2016, when the World Economic Forum announced the fourth industrial revolution, it was a big wake up call for us the coming together of the digital, the physical, and the biological. We once again started evaluating our vision and felt this very strong need to reinvent everything. 
We researched on the future of the world with AI, blockchains, 3D manufacturing, implants, robots, and understood that we're sitting at an inflection point in history where in the next 15 years, the world will change more than it has in the last 150 years. So McKinsey says that the pace of change of the fourth industrial revolution compared to the industrial revolution is 10 times, the scale is 300 times, and the impact 3000 times. Andrew McAfee from MIT in his book, The Second Machine Age, said there will definitely be more technology and fewer jobs. So the million dollar question was, what would humans do? What would get computerized and what would not get computerized? Will we even need people? And research pointed out that machines will do all of the repetitive tasks, whether they're physical or cognitive, and we'll need humans to develop social and creative intelligence in the more non-cognitive, non-repetitive tasks. So when we look at social intelligence, we're basically talking about empathy, perceptiveness, awareness of self and others, bringing others together, reconciling differences, changing hearts and minds, uh, sharing ability to be trustworthy, transparent. These are the things that are going to become the currency of the world going forward in workplaces uh, and in life in general. And creative intelligence, uh, original thinking to come up with unusual ideas, uh, curiosity, deep thinking, putting disparate bits of information together. And it is no secret that our curriculum has really not been working on either of these. So we needed to revamp pretty much everything. And after doing much research uh, and reading quite a bit, I saw that some of these words were beginning to appear in pretty much every body of work talking about educating for the fourth industrial revolution. And take a long, hard look at these words. Is this not what being human means? And in some ways, I thought that there is a force out there which is trying to tell us that we've become too mechanical in our being and machines should be doing what machines should be doing. Technology should be taking care of those parts of our being. We ourselves cannot become machines. And if we are to survive in this world, then it is going to be both a social and an economic imperative to become more human, to rehumanize ourselves. So I believe we are getting into an era of the survival of the humanist. Yet, of course, the challenge is, are we educating to be more human or more machine? So our quest was in terms of rehumanizing education and reinventing to further bring in humanity. So we realigned what we were preparing students for. Uh, what we were preparing students for. Uh, you'll have to move another slide, Sladna. And preparedness for us came in four dimensions. One, the most essential was the self, as I described at the beginning of the journey itself. The ability to know and accept one subhav. How many of us even know what gives us joy? This is a journey to understand my fear, my triggers, my emotions, to understand how to manage them and to express them productively to live a life from a space of consciousness. On the level of relationships, are they becoming too mechanical, too transactional? Is the world going through an epidemic of loneliness? Depression will become the biggest killer in the world by 2030. The capacity to relate, to be able to build deep, meaningful and enduring relationships is essential to a fulfilling life. Third aspect, livelihood on which we focus pretty much all of our education and that too in a very narrow sense. Livelihood can be seen through the lens of money, meaning and mastery and should be viewed holistically. So it's not just about making money, it's about doing something that gives you meaning, that makes you jump out of bed every morning. Doing something that builds mastery, 
where you feel like you're becoming a better human being, like you're learning something every single day. And if you have the self, the relationships and the livelihood in place, do you use it for your own benefit or do you use it to make the world a better place? True joy will only come when you've done something with what you've learned. How do we embed this in kids? How do we sensitize them to this? A lot of kids who come to our schools are coming from very insulated, gated communities. How do you build a curriculum that sensitizes them to the problems the world faces, whether it is the environment, poverty, discrimination, fundamentalism, gender issues? How do you make them agents of change and not mere victims or spectators? To achieve this, we had to work on four pillars in our curriculum and then a lot on our pedagogy, on our instructional processes, on our technology, on SOPs, pretty much everything, so that there was a robust base to drive this curriculum. So strengthening our experiential learning projects, building the human framework, the core of rehumanization, design thinking and maker engineering and literacy. And my team is going to take you through this. And of course, scaling change, instructional leadership, pedagogy, teacher competency frameworks, protocols, a whole lot of things that we're going to share over the next 30 minutes. So I'll start you off with a concrete example of experiential learning, of true project-based learning. Our inspiration comes from expeditionary learning schools, which is perhaps the premier body of work in experiential learning. And uh, it so happened that seventh graders a few years ago started uh, complaining to us, sharing their frustration around how their parents shared with them that they used to ride bicycles in the city and they wanted to get a bike path in Gurgaon. For seventh graders, you know, life is simple. They thought they'll just write a letter to the CM and they'll get a bike path. And then the teachers had to talk to them and help them understand that you got to build a whole case for it. You need to build a viable project for it. And they said, fine, in our project-based learning time, which is one and a half to two hours every day, dedicated across classes, uh, that we'll do a project for the next four to six months where we'll build this case. Now, the very principle uh, that a good project works on, there are, there are some key principles for us. We need an authentic purpose. It should be real, not simulation. So there should be real change in what, and it should be relevant for students. Students should be excited about doing it. And this project met all of those criteria easily. So the first step was bringing old bikes together, getting them to dismantle them, getting them to reassemble them. Then uh, they donated these refurbished bikes uh, to the support staff in the school. Pedagogically, they used hands-on productive work, working with community experts, artisans, working through multiple drafts, the skills level, developing the capacity to create, think, design, innovate, and build an ethic of excellence in craftsmanship. Now, when they were doing this project, they had to divide themselves into several crews, as we call them, several teams, and their project managing this entire thing themselves including holding each other accountable. These are some images. And then the second phase was more around the social aspect of bicycles, understanding the history, present and future. Uh, so how did each component change? How did bicycles evolve? How do things evolve? Uh, how do people invent things? Uh, uh, building prototypes of futuristic bicycles, learning assignments on hypothetical writing, uh, pedagogically, a lot of research group work, counterfactual thinking, prototyping, and skills of thinking like a historian. Also, you know, uh, bicycles were a huge invention uh, for women because the first time women could go out. So what happened centuries ago, 
was that this became a tool for women empowerment. So understanding how everything goes together and life doesn't happen in silos is, is one very important outcome we seek through experiential learning. And the third phase of this was around creating a bike friendly city, studying traffic ecosystems, intelligent traffic management systems, chain journeys of other global cities like Amsterdam. Uh, what does civic action mean? Uh, how do you make a case? How do you build a report, uh, documentaries, case studies, talking to government agencies? How do you make a presentation to them? Uh, how do you make yourself heard? How do you not get treated like uh, a 12 year old? How do you get the respect of an adult? Uh, collating primary data, secondary data, case study analysis, design thinking, proposal writing, civic action, change management, organizing people and resources. All of these are real life skills that can be built into projects inside schools. So let's see some images of them doing primary research. Uh, and, uh, you know, these projects are really interdisciplinary. They cover uh, content and concepts from all different subjects and sciences, how bicycles work, how simple machines work, fiction, drag, humanities, I already discussed, uh, active citizenship, literacy, reading comprehension, writing traits, uh, research writing, uh, math, data collection, data analysis, ratio and proportion, and a lot of visual arts. They did a lot of sketching, created at least 20 different publications uh, that we printed, even sold some of them in shops. And then they presented, uh, when they put all of this together, they actually also conducted a rally with about 600 people, uh, got all politicians, uh, and uh, can we have the next slide please, Lagna? Got, uh, actually, yeah, before I move to that slide, uh, when we do this kind of work, it's important to mention that you build a lot of social intelligence. Uh, kids work in small groups, they're constantly persuading each other, negotiating. There's a lot of failure, a lot of influencing each other, a lot of brainstorming, multiple perspectives, holding each other accountable, a lot of rejection also, and also a lot of creative intelligence, uh, deep engagement, data analysis, you've seen that. Uh, I don't need to go through it. Uh, once they did all of this, they also created, they ran this rally for about 600 people, politicians and bureaucrats from across the country. Uh, and uh, definitely all of them from the city, they went to the traffic commissioner, presented their report. And uh, although they did not get the bike path, they did sow the seeds for the bike path. And uh, they got uh, uh, car free, Sundays uh, on substantial parts of the roads of the city. And uh, that started a movement called Rahagiri, which in non-motorized transport in the country is perhaps one of the biggest movements, started first in Gurgaon and then uh, has, has now reached about 50 cities across the country. Uh, there are many other projects. Uh, this was one example I thought I'll blow up for you to get a good understanding. Our children particularly uh, work on projects that make a real impact in the local context. They do projects on child rights, on biodiversity in Gurgaon, uh, on environmental issues, on uh, audits of all kinds. So they're doing uh, stuff that even the government is not doing and not even the biggest of corporates do at, uh, at 11, at 12, at 13 uh, years of age. So I'll now hand over uh, to Ariana uh, to take you through the human framework and our social emotional learning work. Thank you. Hi, um, it's so beautiful to be with you all. Um, being together in community is healing. And so it's uplifting despite it being virtual, to know that we're in community with you today. Um, as Manit said, I'm Ariana Abadi and Heifetz. Um, I was the head of social and emotional learning and the creator of the human framework. Um, today, I'll be sharing a little bit about the power of moving from an unconscious to a conscious social and emotional learning, which can truly transform ourselves, our relationships, and our communities. 
Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. James Baldwin. Amidst all the suffering and pain we might now be experiencing in our communities and world, we're also in this unique time to pause and reflect on what's not working in our lives, in our societies, and in our world. As Munnett mentioned, so many of us might feel this trained purposelessness, not feeling fulfilled in our relationships, this need to numb or distract from our feelings. So social emotional learning is being call, is a call to face and grapple with and heal what's within us and in our societies. And we must and we can begin this journey together. And by focusing on SEL, we can feel empowered to tackle these challenges. So one of the first steps we took is we created the human framework. And what it does is it names the specific four aspects of ourselves where we can nurture and develop SEL skills and practice them. So what parts of ourselves must be brought into the light in order for us to find more fulfillment, more belonging, more connection to authentic selves, and feel more free as a community of peace builders. So I'll take us through each of these four aspects. The first aspect is my swabhav or my essence. How many of us feel like we lose our tempers with our loved ones and then regret it later? How many of us feel this pressure to suppress our feelings because we're not sure how else to manage them? How many of us feel like we have this self-critical voice in our heads that fills us with a sense of self-doubt? So this aspect of self is about exploring my emotions, my reactions, my yearnings. It's about having that understanding so that we can have a healthier relationship with ourselves and be more resilient when we're faced with challenges. The second aspect of self is my swadharam, my purpose. As Manit mentioned, we all have probably struggled to find our unique purpose on this planet. And many of us probably still do. What gives us that fulfillment, that joy, that meaning? And is being rooted in our swadharam really allowing us to drive our lives? So starting this exploration with children at a young age allows them to start wrestling with those questions young, to be able to connect to their own passions and what's meaningful, to then set goals for themselves so that they can break those into action steps and strive and find deeper connection and relevance to their learning. So my swadhanam is all about then feeling that intrinsic motivation to work towards what's meaningful to me. The third aspect of self is my relationships. So many of us, I know myself included, sometimes feel like my relationships are becoming mechanical, that I find it hard to open up with others, to be vulnerable, or I might discover that I've built walls around myself. So this is really about fostering that true and conscious intimacy, that connection with other people that brings us joy. It's about practicing empathy and building the skill to perspective take, about using diverse opinions and problem solving to engage in conflict resolution. The last aspect of self, which is really our key innovation and my contribution to the field of SEL that was really missing in all that we researched and which was really motivating us to create our own framework altogether, was my context, my water. This is about acknowledging that we do not exist in isolation. We are part of this greater interconnected system. We contain systems within ourselves and we're embedded in the outside systems. So this is about exploring how am I shaped by the world around me? What are those various identities that are given to me by my social conditioning? Whether it's national, religious, gender, caste identities, what are those belief systems and where do they come from? What parts of my religion do I wanna keep that are nurturing and give me value and hope and a sense of spirituality? And what parts of my religion do I wanna let go of that could possibly drive division or supremacy or not feel aligned to my values? And do I have the capacity to question these identities and beliefs and revise them so that I have the freedom to be more aligned to my values and my swadharam? And then how do I understand that interconnectedness to then be a global citizen and contribute positively in the world? So then once we had these four aspects of self, we then needed to develop more concretely SEL standards and learning targets 
for each one that could unpack the skills and knowledge children would need to develop at each age level. And so then those standards broke into learning targets that then were sequenced from junior to middle to senior program and built in complexity. And then those targets could be integrated throughout the school day in any lesson, in any academic subject. And so it's crucial to have these learning tar targets because SEL is not something you have. These are skills you do, they're verbs. So for example, the practice of empathy. Empathy, you practice, you build that muscle. And so for example, I have SEL 3.7, that is a learning standard from my relationships. And then as you can see, it breaks into smaller targets as we drill deeper into what are the skill sets and practices to build my empathetic capacity. So then the question is, how is SEL woven into our school community? So there are a lot of ways that SEL is woven. First and foremost, every teacher is an SEL teacher. That means that we provide SEL teams on each program level that has teacher representatives from each grade that allows for a constant support to allow people to develop their own social emotional capacities and grow in this area. We have parent engagement, we have SEL subject integration, so we're not just having our SEL learning targets in the humanities or expeditions, but we're also having it in math, in science, in literacy, everywhere. We have our SEL curriculums, so similar to how we practice English and Hindi throughout our day, but we also have devoted language classes. SEL is similar. So we practice SEL throughout the day, but then we have our devoted curriculum time where we're focused on it as well. So in junior program, we have a curriculum that we've designed ourselves called Me in Motion. It's got 600 plus lessons that are done daily with our students that engages the body and uses movement pedagogy to really bring these abstract concepts to life. We have middle program morning meetings and circle times um, where students learn these skills while also unpacking classroom dynamics and what's working well and not. And then we have the senior program human framework curriculum. We have overnight some VOD workshops and we have student led assemblies focused on the themes of religion and interfaith dialogue, um, gender and gender based violence and discrimination and philosophical inquiry and human rights as a way of applying now as kids get older, the SEL skills to contexts where it's most difficult to practice them. And then we of course have SEL skills and tools modeled throughout the day, and then a, uh, a mechanism to monitor the quality and growth through our data gap. So I just wanna end with debunking three key SEL myths because it's really not enough to have the framework, the targets, the curriculum. We must shift our mindsets as well. So the first myth I want to raise our attention to is that adults need to perfectly master SEL skills. No, the fact is that adults are continuous learners. That means that we are equally able to make mistakes, to model being vulnerable, and to be equal learners and partners with children as they are learning. Second myth, constant happiness, calm, and positivity is the goal of SEL. No, the fact is that social and emotional health does not equal being happy all the time. All emotions are important and that the goal is to face what we fully feel in the realities of the world and react in what ways are healthy for ourselves and others. This means that we do not neglect or ignore or numb ourselves to what is noticeably problematic in our lives and in the world. We face it honestly, and then we build the tools and the resilience capacities and use those that pain or that anger to fuel us into constructive, loving, healing action. The third is the myth that teachers must make students understand what values are good and what values are bad. No, the fact is that values are not taught by lecturing. Children have an innate sense of their own value systems. They are not empty vessels to be filled. We must create space where they can hear and listen and reflect and tap into that internal ethical compass through building those strong empathetic capacities. So this is really not about imposing our own thoughts and beliefs upon our children. So 
I just want to close with saying that each moment of each day is an opportunity to really change our mindsets. And the time is now to invest in our own and our students social and emotional development. The research backs us up. And we are just seeing thrilling results from our initiatives. And I really hope that we can inspire you to continue to develop your own SCL programs with courage and so that we can be more equipped to face these challenges together as a global community. So thank you so much for uh, allowing me to share some of our insights and I'll now pass it to my colleague Azette to provide us some insights on our literacy program. Thank you, Ariana. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, very kind of you to spend some time with us today. In support of all the other initiatives in the school, we needed to ensure that we had the most challenging, modern research-based approach to literacy and to rehumanize literacy learning as well. So first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our background research and preparation to do that. And then I'll share an overview of some of the implementation pieces. Despite the fact that we haven't actually used test textbooks for several years at Heritage, many aspects of literacy learning were lagging. We understood that mental models about how literacy needs to be taught were quite deeply ingrained. People were dearly holding on to such things as skill-based teaching, whole class teaching, decontextualized word work and grammar work, that the classics make you smart, that slower readers and writers are remedial, that the stronger ones are okay, that fiction is just for pleasure, and that writing always follows a formula. We needed to unfreeze those mindsets and take some action. So we focused on five areas. Firstly, define literacy. What is it for? What is it supposed to do? And then is that what we are actually working towards? Secondly, we changed our assessments to match the definition and thereby to challenge long held notions of what success in reading actually looks like. We set some new targets as a result of those assessments and brought in models of pedagogy and structure to support the targets. We took small, steady training steps with coaching support, identifying what good practice looks like through implementation rubrics and then finally, we curated book collections that really revitalized attitudes and scaffolded the change that we were making. Now, it doesn't matter which definition of literacy you select. They all lead you to the need for literacy learning to provide for great depth in comprehension and interpretation. Also to develop cognitive patience to be able to think hard and deeply about things and metacognitive, metacognitive abilities to relate to yourself and to life. Ernest Hemingway some time ago was once challenged to write a story using only six words. I want you to feel the feeling as you read it. This is what he wrote. Now, nearly all of our students could read those words and know what each one means, but we would really be able to judge the quality of their reading ability by the deeper responses that they gave to their reading. So this means that the quality of books that we read need to allow for this kind of thinking to happen. So this has given us a much greater focus on fiction to help to build the social and the creative intelligence that Manet and Ariana already described. When you engage deeply with fiction, especially if it's well chosen, you actually live as someone else and doing so develops empathy. It also challenges stereotypes and it even helps you reflect on actions that you haven't yet taken and you may have actually been contemplating. This is not reading for pleasure, it is reading for living. Having a new library with 30,000 new books also helped a lot. We also conducted nearly 6,000 assessments in a pretty short time space, and it became very obvious that we needed to shift our mindset from whole class to individuals and groups in a big way. The 1500 one-on-one -on -one assessments that we, we used, um, we used the framework from Fontes and Pinnell because thinking within, thinking about and thinking beyond text 
were the exact building blocks that we needed to expand the view of literacy that people held. Thinking is internal and expanding thinking is expanded thinking is enhanced through obviously interaction with others. So our literacy pedagogical goal is ultimately student independence, being able to deploy a range of literacy strategies as you need them for any text. But this begins with very explicit direct teaching as you see on the left with read alouds and modeled writing. I do, the teacher, you watch, the students, that then moves through co-creation, I do, the teacher, you help, and then helps them to practice and then moving on to supported independence. This is a critical part of the reform because it leads naturally to group and individual work and begins to illuminate for teachers where there is a predominance of whole class literacy teaching, the one thing we really wanted to change. So from all of this, we were able to articulate what I'm calling literacy crimes. Um, I've listed the main ones here, that one book fits all, killing a love of reading and writing by engaging students in reading and writing activities without actually doing any real reading and writing, not providing adequate time for literacy learning, thinking that accurately reading out words is reading success, focusing on the whole group at the expense of individuals, holding on to a kind of book snobbery and book judgment and using abridged classics, forbidding student choice in reading and writing, and to be a literacy teacher who actually chooses not to read. So we also formed literacy committees to help cement the training, leading through their professional learning teams. And our training was initially reading focused. And this took a long time and continues. And here are just a few examples of uh, what we began with. We also unpacked each new training with follow-up in small professional learning communities and developed rubrics that would describe what strong implementation would look like so that it was really clear to everyone when they were doing well. So structurally what happened? Well, everyone needed to find time. Middle grade started with 60 minutes a day and the junior school with 80. We then provided support with structures on how to make it work. The key was differentiation, whole class work only where that would meet the needs of all learners. And this was a big shift in terms of those crimes. Group work by knowing your learners needs very well was the key. So here's an example of a junior plan, what one teacher is doing over a six day cycle from the teacher's point of view. And here is a five day cycle for middle program from the student's point of view. The red T shows where the teacher is actually leading a session and the other work is done independently or in groups. And this was our big shift. I mentioned also the materials. So the joy and enthusiasm from students when we gave them choice was palpable and the data on reading volume skyrocketed. We also saw patterns of development when we let go of reading snobbery seeing children move from obsession with less powerful text like those on the left to confidence to move on to more complex ones. Hand in hand with this freedom to choose went accountability to track their reading and respond as required. We made our own reading journals and every student needs to track and record volume responses through writing and drawing and to use those reflections in discussions with their peers or with their teachers. What I've just given you is a rapid fire overview really of our evolving literacy work. And I thank you. I'm now going to hand over to Nora to lead us through design thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Izzet, and thank you all for joining us. My name is Nora Noshid and I head the design and tech department at Heritage. Today, I will be talking about how technology can be used to promote creative intelligence in our classrooms. As educators, we have always struggled with the role of technology. With the advent of fourth industrial revolution, we still struggle with questions of whether or not we should continue investing in interactive whiteboards and expensive hardware solutions. These are the wrong questions to ask. As Manit pointed out, creativity will be the currency of fourth industrial revolution. 
Hence, creative intelligence should extend to the use of technology in classrooms as well. So the right question to ask would be, how can we as schools position technology in such a way that students leverage it to develop their creative intelligence? The answer is by shifting the interactions with technology from consumption to creation. What does that mean? Our children spend most of their time interacting with technology as consumers, watching YouTube videos, scrolling on Instagram, and playing on mobile apps. But rarely do they interact with technology as creators, designing mobile applications or programming websites. And as long as this gap exists, we limit the ability of our children to look at technology as a tool they can manipulate to create or design products of social or personal good. This further limits the scope of creative intelligence. To address this gap, we developed a comprehensive framework to promote skills that are integral to creative intelligence, such as computational thinking, design thinking, and digital innovation within K-12 spaces. Unlike UK, USA, and Finland, where governments have introduced computational literacy frameworks in their curriculum from elementary grades on, India does not have a framework on how we should prepare our students in a progressive manner. So we researched global standards to understand the use of technology as a creative medium from elementary to high school, and then contextualized it within our curriculum to develop grade-wise learning targets on design thinking, innovation, and technology creation. The question then is, how do we implement these learning standards in our classes to ensure that every child has an equal opportunity to create. Most schools worldwide impart these skills in isolated tinkering labs, maker spaces, or age-old robotic clubs, where these clubs function in complete disconnect to the content students learn outside these spaces. We wanted to ensure that every child had an equal opportunity of solving a real-world problem with technology. So we had to figure out a way to embed the skill within our mainstream subject. So we introduced subject embedded design challenges where students had to create digital prototypes to solve real authentic problem as an extension of science, math, and EVS content. Instead of enrolling for a robotics club or a maker space as a subject, us children now learn the progression of innovation, design thinking, rapid prototyping, while they engage with math, science, and literacy concept. To design these subject embedded design challenges, we used a very unique model, which I'll demonstrate using our existing seventh grade curriculum. We start by looking at our existing project-based curriculum to identify a core content area. In seventh grade, we selected the My Body, My Life expedition, where the core content area was body systems, and how our everyday life choices determine their function. Then we look at the design thinking and maker engineering skill bucket. In our seventh grade, the learning standards we selected included teaching students how to code, the concept of design thinking, and the art of failing forward. We then mapped the core content with the design thinking and maker engineering skill to curate the subject embedded design challenge, which in this case required students to interact with an adult or a close family member to create a digital prototype to improve their lifestyle habits, such as Fitbits, water drinking digital alarms, cardiovascular video games, and anger buster games. So the child learns about using technology, in this case coding, to solve a real world problem as they learn about the science content. Another sixth grade example is when students were asked to design mobile applications to resolve the issue of pollution as they learned about carbon footprint. And in much younger classes, students actually interacted with visually challenged adults and children to create 3D printed resource aids for them. None of these technology design challenges occur in isolation. They are designed for students to dwell deep into a content area, interact with the user, and then use technology to invent a solution. Our focus with technology in our curriculum is not to develop technical skills, but to enhance concepts such as design thinking, rapid prototyping, and instill virtues of collaboration and design failure. We have successfully embedded these design challenges from grade one to grade nine as an extension of our mainstream subjects. 
our work has been leading the way for both local and international schools. We have been invited to present our work at Google India, ISTE in the United States, and BET in London. Shared are some of the headlines our students have been making with their inventions and creations. We are currently working with Harvard to develop a design-based module to introduce soft robotics within social studies to I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, there was a gap. So we're currently working with Harvard to develop a design-based module to introduce soft robotics within social studies to further bridge the gap between technology and creative intelligence. We are steadfast in our ambition to develop a generation of makers, creators, designers, and more importantly, a generation that embraces the potential of technology for social good. We intend on getting there by making sure innovation is the norm and not the exception inside our classrooms. Thank you so very much for your time and for logging in. I now will hand over to Vishnu, who will give an overview of all the curriculum initiatives we have taken. Thank you, Noura, and thank you all for patiently putting up with us for the last 60 minutes or so. Ravi often wants that every minute after 45 minutes, you're gonna have people dropping out, and I don't see that happening, so I hope to do my best to retain your attention for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. This is the uh, penultimate uh, part of this session. Uh, and I'm going to spend about six, seven minutes to help you understand how do we all bring this together. I, it's interesting that, you know, as I was watching my colleague share the first four blocks, uh, I was looking at some of the questions which is coming in the, uh, in the chat section. And one of the questions is, are you a CBS or an IP school? Uh, my quick answer to is, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, of course, we are affiliated to CBSC and Cambridge and IB. We have multiple options for our students. But all of these have been designed. Uh, they are all curriculum agnostic in that sense that this can be fitted into any curriculum or board which you, our school is affiliated to. All that matters was that we had to break down uh, critical competencies into standards and map those standards into our present units. Uh, you would have sensed that from my, uh, from these presentations from my colleagues, uh, is that uh, none of these are after school or they're not parallel tracks. They're actually well integrated into our uh, curriculum, into the regular timetable structure. Uh, so I'm going to spend some time to figure out how this all comes into this. So Manit talked about project-based learning, which is the first block of our school. Uh, Ariana talked about the human framework, which is at the second block on the right top. Uh, Ezzet talked about literacy, which is the third block. The fourth block is design thinking and maker engineering, which Noura just shared. But these are curriculum standards, right? But any good educator would know that curriculum standards are as effective as how they are implemented on the ground into the classroom. What do you mean by implementation? Which means that are these standards well mapped to the lesson plans? Do teachers do a good job of transacting that lesson in the class? Are students engaged enough on those lessons? Are right assessments designed to measure those standards you want to measure? And do those assessment of the students provide a feedback loop into improving the teaching and learning practice. And that is why the center space piece, which is colored in orange for you, uh, is the core piece which brings everything together, which is instruction, leadership, pedagogy, and protocols. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about what we have done. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide, typically we spend about six hours with any new teacher who joins a heritage group of schools, but I'm gonna to try to do this in 60 seconds. Uh, so just bear with me on this. Some of you have asked, would you be getting copies of this PowerPoint? Of course, we'll send that to you, don't worry. Uh, but one key thing is this. Uh, when you're looking at this, just look at the pyramid. Now, this is the core uh, pedagogy pyramid uh, for us, for, uh, for all teachers in our school. Now, this took about a year to build. Uh, as it primarily led this development along with our educators across the schools. Uh, now, this is the pyramid or the lens through which we look at any practice in any class at the heritage schools. Uh, on the right, you see the square rectangular box, which is uh, shaded in yellow or orange. Those are the module training modules, which one has to go through to master those uh, standards. Uh, so that's the way this is structured. Uh, if you look at the pyramid from the bottom, uh, you would find it starts with non-negotiable practices. 
and then goes to place basic classroom management, and then goes to social, emotional, physical safety, and then goes to collaboration. Then there's experiential learning, student engagement, and differentiation. Uh, then metacognition, substantive conversations about the quality of conversation, deep depth of thinking students undergo in a class. And lastly, self-directed learning. Now there are rubrics built for each of these, and each of these rubrics could be student-facing as well as teacher-facing. So anybody can walk into it, refer a rubric, and say, hey, whether this teacher, what level of proficiency is this teacher transacting in that particular class? Uh, for those of you who are exposed to teacher observation protocols anywhere in the world, be it Morzano's or Danielson framework, you would largely see that those standards actually start from the uh, tire number four, four or row number four, which is collaboration. Now, in our research, we realized that those standards probably fit into the Western model or Western schools. But for an average Indian school, an average Indian teacher, uh, you need to go a little more basic than beyond collaboration. And that is why we started focusing on non-negotiable practices, basic classroom management and social, emotional, physical safety, which often we take it for granted, but we'll be very surprised. Even in best of schools in this country, some of the teachers are not aware of these. You have to articulate and tell them that this is important. Uh, on the left-hand side, you would find that this teaching pyramid, in, an, in some sense, how teachers teach in our classes, are supported by two key things which is highlighted in red. One is cognitive coaching. Uh, we heavily partnered and borrowed some of the frameworks from the adaptive, uh, collab adaptive schools network, largely in the US, but you would find this in many interaction schools abroad. Uh, this is a way in which you coach teachers in their own, in mastering their own craft of teaching. Uh, in this, we spent about a couple of years getting in a team from the US, uh, working with our teachers and building a band of teachers who can do coaching of other teachers so that there is a culture of continuous improvement of teaching and learning practice. And another thing which we also did over the last two, three years is data teams and ILTs. ILTs stand for instruction leadership teams. These are empowered teams who are specialized in looking at student data, looking at the way uh, teaching and learning happens, collecting data around this framework and feeding that data back so that there is continuous improvement which happens. Uh, there are several dimensions to this. We'll, we'll be happy to clarify if you're more interested in this, but due to, in the interest of time, I'm going to move to the next slide. So how did, all, how did we all make this happen? Because uh, a school is ever busy with transacting the curriculum. So it is always important for us to focus on what is right. And it's always been a challenge to take time out and do some of these things. So what we did uh, about five, six years back, uh, Manut and me were figuring out what is a structural uh, investment we need to make to make all of these happen. You know, all these were happening since right from day one, but it never got institutionalized uh, deeply as a practice. So one of the things we did was we created a central team and the team's core focus was to build capabilities in these five domains. Uh, so we created a PMO, it's not the Prime Minister's office, it is a project management office. Uh, and the first mandate of this project management office three, four years back was to hunt or in some sense scout from around the world uh, the best team to put this. And that's the team you see, uh, and we are some of the fellow panelists in this panel sharing. Uh, we really looked out at almost a, a, about 18 months project to actually find these people uh, get them on board and shift them to India and help them uh, start working with our schools. Uh, second big task was to generating buy-in, which means that how do you convince our own parent community, a teacher community to start focusing deeply on this? For example, many schools have uh, projects, but how do you translate that projects into deeper design thinking projects? Or how do you translate some of your morning rituals or circle times into deeper social emotional learning work? Uh, so it was a complete change management process in itself. So we did several workshops with teachers, several workshops with parents. In fact, one of the questions people have asked, how did you convince parents to be ready for this? So we did a series of workshops at Fourth Industrial Revolution about 2016 and made parents understand, right, about four or five years back, that, hey, change is coming. If we don't ask for a different model of education, our children are going to suffer. And we created the change. We created a need for the change before we implemented any of these. The third thing which we did was we created a system within the community itself to help these leaders to work. For example, each of like Ez, Ariana, Nura, uh, they all had a small team of champions among the teachers who helped them to implement more work. That team of champions also helped these leaders to figure out what works, what doesn't work, iterate the process. For example, the teacher pyramid itself, I think there are about 20 teachers 
who worked with EZ uh, to iterate this model of, of, of how a teacher observation should happen. And this is still work in progress, for example. So we created a system and an ecosystem within the school community to make this go deeper. Uh, and lastly, uh, and it's a critical discipline, which we really want even our students to have, is to have a product building mindset. Uh, you know, come to think of it, India is known as a tech hub. Uh, but rarely do you find a product company out of India coming out. We only have thesis and Infosys, but not a Google or a Facebook or a Zoom uh, out of India, because we don't have a product mind, uh, mindset. Uh, when we build anything in a school for it to last longer, we have to have a product mindset, which means whatever you build for the school, you should have the discipline you'd have had to build it for another school also, for an outside customer also. Uh, whatever we build, for example, were well documented. There were revisions. Uh, there were multiple stakeholders give feedback. So how would you develop a product if you have to take it to a market? That's the discipline rigor we had when we built these, even in, inside for our own inside community. Next slide, please. Uh, what's the journey forward? You know, I think you heard for the last an hour or so about what we did uh, uh, from uh, all of us. Now, there are three things which we intend to do going forward. One is, I think we want to institutionalize each of these five buckets or COEs, what we call as centers of excellence, which means that we're going to invest more and we've continued, continued our investments more into getting more experts into this and create them as centers of excellence so that if any schools want any advice or help, we'll be able to provide those. We also want to make these curriculum modules more deeper and institutionalized into our, into our existing schools as well as our new campuses coming up. Uh, the second is, uh, these are built to scale up to larger models. One of the primary drivers of design, I think Manit shared in the first part of the session, is that we don't want this to be exclusive, to be used only in privileged private schools of small scale. We want this to go to a larger school, even a budget, budget private school, where if an average Indian kid should have access to each of this work. So we're, we're building in such a way that the cost is much lesser, the quality is not compromised when we take it to a larger crowd. And the third uh, key focus for us, uh, which in fact has been uh, accelerated because of the COVID shutdown, is the technology platform, is that much of this work we have created in the last five, six years, we have now moved into an online technology platform. Uh, uh, part of it is an LMS, part of it is an assessment tracker. Uh, for example, we also have a system right now to observe teachers and give feedback so that there are dashboards to see that where teachers' proficiency are in terms of their own quality of teaching and learning. Uh, so these are the three focus areas which we are doing and we'll continue to do so. And we'll be more than happy to have some of you folks in our campus whenever you're ready or even share some of our lessons. Now I'm just gonna hand over to the last part of the session, which is a closer session to Nina, who heads the Google campus. Nina, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sure by now most of you would have exhausted uh, listening to us, but I can promise you I'll be very brief and very short. My colleagues have taken you through a detailed description of how curriculum evolved and what all did we do to ensure that all of us were on the same page and had the shared understanding. I would like to talk more from the perspective of operations and the culture of the organization. Now, the social and the creative intelligence, it flourishes in the spaces, which are very highly creative and give space for communication, collaboration, negotiation of ideas, and freedom to take risks. An organization that allows this to happen and is able to provide the environment which is conducive to such practices will certainly see a great amount of success in achieving their goals. Hence, the right kind of structures and the effective robust processes increase the efficacy of any organization. So the important question is, how do we sustain this culture? It is new, it, is, it needs openness to new ideas, ability to take feedback, engage in reflective practices, ensure that as a leader, you're operating from trust and faith and assuming positive intentions of all the stakeholders. It is also about how do you engage in distributive leadership, yet which converges and diverges for all functional reasons, for purposes, at the right time and in the right way. 
as an organization, one of our objectives is to ensure that we are constantly engaged in the pursuit of creating layers of leadership amongst our teaching faculty as well as our children. So the major focus of the school's attention is to invest on professional development of the teachers. As Vishnu said, for us to, uh, to create a framework for curriculum and pedagogy, it needed a lot of sifting and sorting even in the alignment of the org structure. It also demanded for each one of us to acknowledge that we are a professional learning community and the purpose is to maintain that professionalism in, our, in all aspects of our life. It also meant that we realigned our structures in the organization in such a manner that we could collaborate and create understandings across through vertical and horizontal meetings. So the entire process of putting this together took an amount of energy for us uh, to really value which, what each teacher was doing. Each person took participate, participated in each of the processes that we did or performed in our school. Being, when I look back, when I look back at my association with, uh, with Heritage for the last 16 years, I can only recall that we have been constantly learning, constantly learning and evolving. There has been no point when we really not, uh, you know, where we have looked back or <clears throat> we have sort of stopped or become constant at any point of change. So we always maintain that the only thing that is constant is, is change. And probably that's how we have practiced it all these years. With this, I would like to thank all my colleagues and all the guests for lending your valuable time. We will be more than happy to have you visit our campus and experience the culture that has come in through a lot of collaborative efforts. And I would really like to thank my team, my members, and also all the guests for being here. Thank you so much. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Manit. And thank you, everyone from uh, Heritage Experiential Learning School. Manit, do you want to uh, uh, leave all these attendees with a parting note or something? Thank you, uh, Ravi. Uh, it's, uh, I notice a lot of people are still there. And uh, uh, sorry for taking a little longer than we should have. But there's just so much to share. Uh, this is just really a glimpse into what we do. If we look at uh, SEL, literacy, uh, the making work, the creative work that we do, or even the teacher competency frameworks, etc. They're all workshops in themselves. Like we could run them for two days uh, and uh, we'd still not even scratch the surface. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is 17 years of continuous work. And uh, like Nina said, we'd be happy uh, to have some of you over, uh, uh, God willing, uh, uh, we should be able to open up soon. And when we do, uh, yeah, we, we, we'd love to have people over and experience uh, a lot of this. And uh, happy to share the presentation. Ravi, please, please share it with many people who are asking for it. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for your patience. I am not sure we'll be able to get into all the questions uh, and answers. Uh, we, uh, I did try to respond to some of them, uh, but uh, you send them to Ravi regardless and uh, uh, with your email addresses and, and we'll, we'll definitely reach out. Perfect. I, I think I have a better idea here. I mean, I'll, I'll give you all uh, a minute. I mean, all the attendees who actually uh, put some questions in the Q&A uh, section. Uh, just copy it from there and uh, post it on the School News Facebook Live and I'll request Manit and the entire team to spend some time on uh, you know, these questions over the weekend and try to answer. And uh, uh, of course, I mean, PPT once received from Sulagna will be uh, shared as a, a OneDrive link on the thank you email, which we are going to uh, send after this webinar along with the YouTube link. Uh, 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 can I request all the panelists to switch on their cameras in, uh, and at least, I mean, uh, all the attendees could see all of us live. Yeah, there you are. As it will have to, uh, 
Okay, okay, okay. So we have all the panelists here. Thank you uh, very much, Manet. I mean, for uh, this brilliant uh, session. I think uh, Vishnu, you were right. I mean, uh, we have seen a very low uh, decline in the number of attendees. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ezra. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Ariana, and thank you, Nura, for the wonderful session. And I think uh, if I share your email ID, I mean, you are going to hang me live. I mean, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but uh, amazing, amazing session. And I so look forward to meet you all uh, in person uh, on the other side. And uh, I think, I mean, that's about it. And uh, we will be sharing the YouTube link on the thank you email along with the PPT. So Lagna will have to send it to me right away after this webinar. And uh, here we go. Good evening. And please go and make yourself some coffee. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a nice. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.